Hey there, I pray this video encourages you and helps you grow and become more like Jesus. Follow along with the notes linked in the description. And don't forget to hit the subscribe button. Enjoy. We're in between a new series, so next week starts our new series in the book of Acts. And I'm really excited about it because Acts tells us a lot about Christianity, Jesus, the mission of the church. So I've, I'm writing this message. I always write my messages considering everyone, seekers, unbelievers, um, and Christians. But this series is going to help you as a church, but also have content for you to send people that don't know what Christianity is, who Jesus is, what's the purpose of church, why are there churches everywhere around the world. So buckle up. I pray that you make church attendance this year the, like your best church attendance ever, okay, through this series. Like, do your best. I know we got to travel and go places sometimes, but what if we had, like, the best church attendance and we invited our friends? By the way, uh, statistics say that people actually want to come to church. They're just waiting for you to invite them. And that they actually have amazing encounters with God when they come to church. So don't be afraid to invite them. It's going to be called Acts, Christianity, and its mission. So it will help people know what Christianity is all about. And I encourage you to, to be inviting your friends and family to that. Or send our sermons online on YouTube. Today's message is called Keep Your Fire for the Lord. How many know you can be on fire for God? I mean, you know, though, that sometimes our fire can get covered or put out a little bit. And that we actually are supposed to keep our fire going. We have a responsibility and a role in the Christian faith to keep our fire for the Lord burning. Romans 12, 11 says this, and we're going to be, this is our main text, just one verse for now. We have some other examples. But Romans 12, 11 in the NIV says this, never be lacking in zeal or passion but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. The NLT version says, never be lazy, the New Living Translation, never be lazy, but work hard and serve the Lord enthusiastically. Now this scripture can mean your personal relationship with God, keeping it vibrant, but also keeping your serving for the Lord vibrant, representing him, working for him and doing his will on earth. Our passion for the Lord can diminish, believe it or not, and our passion for his work to be done can diminish. Uh, Everyone deals with it. If you haven't dealt with it, you're not telling the truth. We all have felt like our fire's gone out a little bit, and I'm praying today that this will encourage you and help you know how to keep it going or to, to rekindle that fire for the Lord again. Amen? This would be considered a spiritual discipline, and it's not often preached about or talked about, but it's in Scripture everywhere. You'll, you'll read words and phrases such as be diligent, be vigilant, keep, stand firm, hold on, be alert, on guard, give wholeheartedly, unswervingly, or make every effort. There are these key words and phrases in many Scriptures that say to keep strong, to stay strong, and to stay fervent or on fire for the Lord. I've looked at this as like spiritual momentum. How many of you know when you go to the gym three days in a row, you're feeling good? I guess no one does. I, it was super quiet. <laughs> ah, we tried that. We're done with it. You go to the gym three days in a row, you're feeling good. You're like, I'm back the fourth day. I'm ready to go. Or, or you eat healthy. Like one day. Two days, yes, three days. My wife and I, we celebrated um, our wedding, 17th wedding anniversary yesterday. And uh, yeah. And if you're trying to get health momentum in your life, you do not go to a Mexican restaurant (laughs) because of the chips and salsa. If you can deny those in the beginning, you have self-control, all right? And no cheating if you have gluten allergy, that's not fair. You know, you know you can't touch it or whatever. But, but like spiritual fervor or keeping your fire for the Lord is like having spiritual momentum. Once you get going, it just, you stay on fire for the Lord. You're more excited for him. You don't want to stop reading the Bible. You want to pray more. You want to do more for the Lord. That's a good thing, right? Well, I'm praying that today you will be encouraged that this school year for us in church, like this is a big 
uh, start to a new season for us because a lot of ministry happens from September to June. Not that it doesn't happen in the summer because we're, we're nonstop, but we're excited about making an impact in this community. And I don't want the devil to put your fire out. I want God to keep your fire burning bright. And I feel like God wanted to talk about that today specifically before we get into our series. So again, our scripture was this, never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Never lacking means not shrinking back or not hesitating and, and also not being lazy. The word zeal has to do with diligence or being diligent in matters or being fervent in the Holy Spirit. So being on fire with the Holy Spirit. Um, keep your spiritual fervor literally means to actually be boiling in the Greek. So to be like so on fire for God or for your life to be, you know, hot and not lukewarm or cold, but boiling and on fire, active. Uh, at salvation, the Lord gave you the Holy Spirit, okay? And the Holy Spirit in the Bible the imagery that goes with the Holy Spirit is water, uh, fire, and a dove to represent the Holy Spirit because they couldn't see him. So they use those elements. But we're going to see in Acts that fire comes up in the first couple of chapters for the Holy Spirit. So there's a fire burning inside of you, and his, he's the Holy Spirit. The Bible also calls God in Hebrews the all-consuming fire. So if, if God puts this zeal and passion for him and his work in your life, there is a role for us at Salvation and On to keep that alive, to keep tending to the fire and not letting it go out. And so I'm going to share more of that as we keep going, but I want you to understand it, at Salvation, you already have a fire in you. If you don't feel anything for God, that means you still need salvation in Jesus Christ. But as Christians, we also can be in the life so long and get a little laid back so much that even we need to be reignited for the Lord. If you feel that way, it's okay, but it's not okay to stay that way. Amen? Because the Lord is a fire. So for us to be cold or unconcerned or unenthusiastic about him or, or his will on earth is not healthy, and so that's why we're at this message today. 2 Timothy 1, 5 through 7 is our next scripture, an example. And Paul is talking to his understudy, his apprentice, Timothy, a young pastor. And this is what he says. Paul says, I remember your genuine faith. For you share the faith that first filled your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice. And I know that same faith continue strong in you. Notice those words. This is why I remind you to fan into flames the spiritual gift God gave you when I laid my hands on you. We're not sure exactly what his spiritual gift was, but here's what we do know. He is saved, so fan that flame of salvation, but also use the gifts that God has given you, okay, for the work of God. Verse 7, for God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity, but of power, love, and self-discipline. Some versions say self-control. Now, I love the word self-discipline here because it takes discipline to keep the fire going. Have any of you tended a fire before at a camp out or a fire pit? It goes out if you don't tend to it, if you don't keep it burning. If you don't throw another log on the fire, the fire goes out, doesn't it? Well, one night I was actually trying to get my fire, not my spiritual fire, to die out, my literal fire pit to die out because uh, I wanted to go to bed. I didn't like it burning while I'm still awake. That's just the way I am. And uh, I think one of my kids slipped another log in the fire before they went inside. So guess what? I had to stay up later and wait for the fire to die out. But what's cool is I got to hang out with God more underneath the stars, talk to him, and we, we had a, a really powerful moment together. So I was grateful in the end for that. But sometimes uh, we, we have to, I mean, sorry, all the time, we need to be tending that fire so it stays hot for the Lord. All right? Now, he says his faith is strong. It's the same faith that continues strong in you. All right? To have that self-discipline, to keep zeal and fervor for the Lord, 
Discipline chooses the better option, the more productive habit that fuels the fire instead of putting it out. So I love how he uses the word self-discipline there. What about this book, Jude? Yes, there's a book called Jude in the Bible. It's like the smallest book in the Bible most, and it, it doesn't even have chapter numbers because there's only one chapter. So Jude 20 through 21 is actually the verses, and this is what Jude writes. And the context of this is that there were people that had wormed their way into the church and were deceiving it and causing people to fall and to sin. And he's saying, guard yourself from them and hold on to the truth. And this is what he says in contrast to what they're doing. This is what he wants them to do to the church. But you, dear friends, by building yourselves up in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in God's love as you wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to bring you to eternal life. Now, does that sound like, keep the verse up. Does it sound like that you just hit cruise control after salvation and you just cruise on into heaven? No. It, there's an activity. There's a pursuit. There's a keeping, a protection of what God has done in your life. The salvation, there is a working out your salvation in fear and trembling, Paul says in Philippians. Dear friends, by building yourselves up, that word building yourselves up in your, in your most holy faith, that has to do with progressing in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That has to do with reading the word, understanding God, asking him to help you understand who he is, understand scriptures, okay? Praying in the Holy Spirit, it, it doesn't necessarily mean praying in tongues here, although some people render it that. What it really means is, is praying through the help and the power of the Holy Spirit. But you can do both. People may pray in the spirit and in tongues and be praying in eternal language they don't, they don't know, a heavenly language they can't understand but the Spirit of God is praying through them. But we can also pray in the language we do know, our English language, our native language, and we could be praying powerful, fervent prayers that are gonna do work for the Lord and encourage our soul. So he says, pray. Okay, so keep yourselves built up in the faith through the word, pray, and then keep yourselves in God's love as you wait for the mercy of our Lord. You don't necessarily keep yourself saved because it's not by your efforts that you are saved. It's by grace through faith that you are saved. But what we can do is we can be obedient to the Lord because the Bible says, if you love me, you will obey me. So we keep ourselves in God's love by being in fellowship with him. And we stay in fellowship with him by doing his will and by, by really actually even fellowshipping with God, like having a personal relationship with him, praying, talking to him, and practicing and obeying his word. So that's how we keep ourselves in his love. And then it says waiting, waiting for the, for the Lord Jesus Christ to come back. Waiting has an expectancy. So you're not just chilling, hanging out, and, you know, haphazardly, you know, doing things for the Lord. No, this is an intentional uh, keeping yourselves strong in the Lord, edified and built up, praying, all right, uh, loving God and staying in love with him, and then lastly, waiting for his return. And in the next couple of verses, it says to actually help other people do the same thing in that same book. So while we're waiting, we're supposed to be actively pursuing more of God and helping other people do the same thing as we wait for his return. You know, right now, we are in the season of waiting for Jesus to come back, right? This scripture applies to us so much right now. And the signs are just coming out left and right. So I want to share, to, to, to wrap this uh, sermon up, and we're only halfway through, so stay, stay buckled in. Don't unbuckle yet, okay? How do we keep this fire going? But maybe you need to be reignited today. This also will help you as well. Number one, I want to encourage you with this, and it's a warning too. Beware of idleness. Doing nothing. Beware of that. Careful. Because again, if we can be fervent and on fire for the Lord and his work and be all in, we can also be cold and unconcerned with his work. And a lot of times that happens because we choose to not do anything. And we become idle. 
We don't pursue God or we don't do anything for the Lord. All right? Uh, First, First Thessalonians 5, 14 says, And we urge you, brothers and sisters, warn those who are idle and disruptive, encourage the disheartened, help the weak, be patient with everyone. This is Paul talking to the church, and it's not him necessarily warning them. He's actually telling them to warn each other. So that would be like you all helping each other by warning each other not to be idle, but to be active in pursuing the Lord in doing his work. But Paul tells them to make sure they're encouraging each other uh, to go forward. How many know Charles Spurgeon? One day he warned Uh, He's a famous pastor, had uh, powerful sermons. He was anointed, a man of prayer, a man of the word, and did a lot for the kingdom of God. And he had a powerful sermon about the dangers of being idle in the Christian faith. And here's some of the key points he said. A man who wastes his time in sloth offers himself to be a target for the devil, who is an awfully good rifleman. In other words, Idle men tempt the devil to tempt them. Woof. You think he still had a job after that? Yeah, he did. If the devil catches a man idle, he will send him to work for him and find him tools. See, idleness is low-hanging fruit for the devil. If you're not doing anything for the Lord, it won't take much to get him to do something for him get you to do something for him. This is true story. This is real life for us Christians. If we're not pursuing the Lord relationally and personally, and if we're not doing something for his will, unfortunately, even Christians can be tempted to do things the devil wants you to do. That's hard reality, but it's true. Religion, he said this, religion never was designed to make us idle. Jesus was a great worker, and his disciples must not be afraid of hard work. An idle car sits there and uses up gas. A car that's moving to the next destination and doing the work, it's getting things done, right? Move in the the right direction. Move with God. What about David, King David? What got David in trouble? You know the story, possibly? David stays back. He doesn't go to war. His custom was to lead the army into, into battle. He stays back this one time, and guess what? His idleness tempted him to take another man's wife, and he fell. And his kingdom was never the same after that. He dealt with conflict and strife. God forgave him, but he never had the same kingship and kingdom ever again. Here's a point for that. There's a time to rest. But it's important that even when we rest, we honor God in our rest. That we still behave properly. We still are pursuing the Lord. When we rest, when we take a Sabbath on Saturday or whatever break or vacation, it's not a vacation from God. It's actually a vacation from more of God. A Sabbath is for more of God, not less of him. And thank you, by the way, for taking time to be here today so that God could speak into your life. 1 Peter 5, 8 says this, Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. Peter is talking to a church who's suffering severe persecution, which we're not suffering in that way. And he's telling them, be alert and of sober mind. We actually need to be alert and have a sober mind because the devil is slick at interfering with our lives and keeping us from God. All right? So here's another thing we can do. Number two, fuel the fire. Fellowship with God every day. When Moses encountered God at the burning bush, That burning bush changed his life forever. But do you think that Moses quit hanging out with God? No. If you read in scripture, there was a tent of meeting where God and Moses hung out all the time. 
And, and Moses heard from the Lord, and Moses talked to the Lord. We need to have a bush or a burning bush lifestyle in our lives. We need to spend time in prayer and reading the word on a regular basis. I know you're going to, look, Pastor Ryan's going to say that until I'm blue in the face and until I die or I'm no longer pastoring here. You know why? It works. Can you imagine seven days straight of reading the Bible and talking to God? Do you think you're going to come out of that the same? No. You're going to come out on fire. The Lord is going to deposit some fresh word in you, encouraging things, and his spirit is going to lift you up. Take the challenge. Do a seven-day challenge with me. Read the Bible every day for seven days. Now, I'm not saying start in Leviticus. <laughs> okay, even though there's some pretty good stuff in there. Okay, if all the distractions are set aside, you can see some pretty good stuff. What I want to encourage you to do is read through the book of Psalms. All right, start with Psalms 1. Or read a gospel book. Or get ahead on book of Acts. Okay, Read it every day. I promise you God's going to speak to you. I promise you God's going to light a fire in you again. At least, at least a pilot light that wants to burn for the Lord. And you're going to want to come back to the word of God. The Bible says, taste and see that the Lord is good. You have to eventually taste the Lord and want to come back. Okay, taste his wisdom, his knowledge, his power, his truth. It's, it's amazing. His presence. Evangelist Robert L. Sumner in his book, The Wonder of the Word of God, tells of a man in Kansas City who was severely injured in an explosion. His face was badly disfigured and he lost his eyesight as well as both hands. He had just become a Christian when the accident happened and one of his greatest disappointments was that he could no longer read the Bible. Then he heard about a lady in England who read Braille with her lips. Hoping to do the same, he sent for some books of the Bible in Braille. But he discovered that the nerve endings in his lips had been too badly damaged to distinguish the characters. One day, as he brought one of the Braille pages to his lips, his tongue happened to touch a few of the raised characters, and he could feel them. Like a flash, he thought, I can read the Bible using my tongue. At the time Robert Sumner wrote his book, this man had read through the entire Bible four times with his tongue. There goes my excuse. <laughs> wow. That's powerful. There's a passion for the Lord like that, that is attainable. We've been hearing words from the Lord from the congregation that there's more. There's more to be had from the Lord. Can we just start with the basic, what he's already given us? There's more right here. There's so much wisdom and power and truth and freedom found in these pages for you. So much encouragement. You know, you could come here on Sundays and get filled up and be encouraged. But can I tell you a little secret? You can get encouraged by God every single day before you get here. It's a great secret, isn't it? Secrets out. God wants to encourage you way before you hear a sermon here on Sunday morning. We're just here to help with that as pastors, but God wants to speak to you tonight, tomorrow, whenever you open his word. Give him the chance. So we talked about, one, look out for idleness. Beware of it because, you know, it, it doesn't, it's exactly what the devil wants you to do is to, to not pursue God, to not do anything for him. We talked about pursuing God through fellowship with him every day, through prayer and reading the word. And my verse for that, actually for the word, was Psalm 119, 11, 15 through 16. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. I will study your commandments and reflect on your ways. I will delight in your decrees and not forget your word. Store the word of God in your heart. Memorize it. Keep it in your heart. All right, why? Well, third point, guard yourself from things that hinder your fire. There are things that are trying to put your fire out. Uh, example, one of the biggest examples is busyness. Busyness causes us to neglect fellowship with God, neglect being with the people of God, whether it's a church or a small group, neglecting serving or using our gifts. Uh, we tend to make sinful choices when we're tired, exhausted, and busy. And all these actually can put out your fervor and fire 
for the Lord. Even Jesus said in Matthew 26, 41, uh, talking to his disciples, and that would be us too, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. So we have to understand that our flesh struggles to be disciplined. Like our spirit wants to, we want to, like our Christian heart and our spirit wants to be disciplined and faithful to the Lord, but our flesh is weak. So we need to be aware of that. Okay, uh, Psalm 141, four. Here's a prayer we can pray. Don't let me drift toward evil or take part in acts of wickedness. Don't let me share in the delicacies of those who do wrong. Proverbs 4, 23 says, above all else, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. Other versions say, keep your heart with diligence. Out of the overflow of your heart, the mouth speaks. Out of the overflow of your heart, you do. I do. We must guard our heart and what we put in it. And your heart and mind are connected. So what you put in your heart and mind, they, they correlate together. Daniel, when he was taken as a prisoner in Babylon, verse 8, Daniel 1.8 says this, but Daniel purposed or determined, resolved in his heart that he would not defile himself with a portion of the king's delicacies, nor with the wine which he drank. It's a... The implication there and the studies show uh, that there, were, there was food sacrificed to him or other gods, and Daniel did not want to partake in that. He didn't want to defile himself because he only served the Lord, so he stayed away from the food and drink they offered him. Here's something I don't want you to forget. If you're not moving forward, it doesn't take much to go backwards. Just a little lesson I've learned from my own experience. If we're not moving forward, it doesn't take much to go backwards. If you're doing something for the Lord, if you're pursuing him too, most of all, a relationship with him and serving him, you're less likely to go backwards. We do need to rest, but we must rest productively too, as we learned already. Fourth, we're almost done. Stay active in serving the Lord. Typically, in churches, we teach spiritual disciplines are reading the Bible, praying, you know, fasting. Those are really good. But a lot of people don't include serving. And I don't understand that. Because one of the first things Jesus taught the disciples to do is to serve. After he said, follow me. In order to make us fisher of men, we have to serve with Jesus. Jesus said, I came to serve and not to be served. So if we're trying to be more like Jesus, we will serve. And I don't know if you are serving right now in some way, shape, or form that no one sees. Praise the Lord. Only God sees it. Thank you for doing that. I don't know if you've been feeling nudged to get involved in serving. It may not have to be here in a ministry. It may be something we do in the community. All I know is serving the Lord helps me stay on fire for God. One of the reasons why is because I'm being more like Jesus and I encounter Jesus when I serve. When I serve, I can tell Jesus is showing up in those situations or in those ministries or in those opportunities. It's exciting to do the work of the Lord. I think I missed an important quote actually that goes along with that in uh, Charles Spurgeon's sermon. He said, religion never was designed to make us idle Jesus was a great worker, and his disciples must not be afraid of hard work. Did I already say that? Oh, well, there you go. I got a lot of notes here. All right. Staying active, serving the Lord. Uh, Hebrews 6, 10 through 12. Listen to this scripture. God is not unjust. He will not forget your work and the love you have shown him as you have helped his people and continue to help them. We want each of you to show the same diligence, there's that word, to the very end, so that what you hope for may be fully realized. We do not want you to become lazy, but to imitate those who through the faith and patience inherit what has been promised. You know what the scripture is actually talking about? It's talking about ministry with other people and for other people. In other words, you don't have to wait for six months till Calvary puts on an outreach to help other people follow Jesus. You can do that every day, every week, 
all year. These people were being commended and being reassured that God is going to bless them for helping their fellow believer grow. Church, you don't have to wait for us to do something. You have been following Jesus. If you've been reading your word, you've been praying, if you've been in church for a certain amount, I don't know, however long you've been in church, year, two years or more, you have the word of God stored in your heart. You have influence. You have people in your life that you could help follow Jesus. And lastly, which is very connected to that, stay in community with those who are on fire for the Lord. You probably heard this analogy before. Have you ever removed a coal out of a grill or a fire pit or whatever you use? When you remove that coal, what happens to it? It gets cold. You put that, that coal back in with the other coals that are on fire, it gets on fire again. It gets hot. You were not meant to be by yourself or do this journey alone in the, in the Christian faith. You were meant to do it in the family of God. You actually need, and I actually need, people to help me stay on fire for the Lord. Church is great. On Sunday morning, we get to come together, and it's powerful. But I'm a small group leader. I've experienced a different kind of community throughout the week. I've experienced something that it's hard to accomplish on Sunday morning because I'm up here preaching on 30-some minutes right now, and you haven't had a chance to pray or encourage one another. Do you know that they gathered together on a regular basis in the Bible so they could encourage and pray and spur one another on towards love and good deeds? There's some things you can't do in the big setting that has to happen in the small setting. Uh, Hebrews 10, 23 through 25 Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching, capital D there, for Jesus' return. The signs are in front of us, if you read scripture. Jesus is coming back soon. And as we're waiting, we're being told in scripture to not neglect being together, but not just on Sundays, but throughout the week. There's something powerful that takes place when you're sitting with other believers, whether it's coffee, dinner, small group, Bible study, prayer group, where the Lord works by his spirit and he encourages us. But then God gets to use your life and encourage the people around you. What if this year you took time in your week to help us minister to one another, to work together, not waiting for a Calvary sponsor group, but you got with people to read the Bible and pray and fellowship and encourage one another. We don't have to wait till the pastors organize everything. Even today, even the people you meet every Sunday here, you could take time to catch up and to meet up uh, outside of church and be there for each other. Amen? It's so important. But we also have many groups starting. But here's the thing. We don't have enough. We don't have enough groups. We don't have enough group leaders. And so sometimes we just need to do it organically and naturally in the church body. So even today as you leave, it's something to consider and pray about for this year. I love what 2 Timothy 2.22 says, flee the evil desires of youth and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the name of the Lord out of a pure heart. Notice the word pursue. It doesn't say kick back and then righteousness will just hit you in the face one day. Love and faith will just hit you. No, we have to pursue those things. And we pursue Jesus to get those. Along with those who call on the name of the Lord. So being in good company with other people who are chasing after God. That sounds good to me. 
That's always helped me grow. Amen? Why don't we stand together as we close this out? I get it. We are busy people. Too busy, to be honest with you. And maybe you've been burned by some relationships. Maybe you have a hard time trusting. Maybe you've lost some friendships over the years in the church. It's hard. It's hard to want to jump back into that community again. All I know is I have seen the value of it so much, I keep chasing after that. I couldn't be here today without the people of God who have been in my corner, who have been praying for me. I really want to encourage you to make sure you're coming here on a regular basis. If you can't meet with people, be here at least. When we come here, can we make sure we're encouraging? Can we make sure that we're being friendly and gentle with one another? If we're going to invite our unsafe friends, neighbors, family members, can we be careful how we treat people in the pews and around? Amen? And, and can we be active and, and loving and caring for one another, even if you feel led by the Holy Spirit to pray for someone before you go or ask if they need prayer or to reach out to them uh, further because you've built a connection and relationship here by sitting together or something like that. I know all that can sound really weird, and, and I'm not trying to be desperate. I'm just trying to help us practice Scripture. We can spur and encourage one another on towards love and good deeds. There's things that you have been through, like I taught last week. You've been in the pit, and now you're praising the Lord. Well, someone might be in the pit in the pews today, and your, your journey, your testimony could encourage them. You just never know. So let the Lord lead you in that as well. This series is critical. We'd love for you to come out and bring people, invite people. Um, get involved this year to keep that fire going. Get involved in our outreaches and serving opportunities. And uh, we have plenty of ministries here if you need help with that as well. Are you on fire for the Lord? Yes. And are we getting there? Yes. Yeah. We're working on it. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Praise God. <clears throat> Let's pray. Lord, we thank you. Thank you for lighting a fire in us at salvation, for your Holy Spirit, your holy fire burning in us, a hunger and a passion for more of you. Lord, if, if any of us here have lost that, I pray, God, you would reignite it by your spirit today. And Lord, that we would be uh, disciplined with ourselves, that we would cooperate, we would be intentional with our own bodies, our own hearts and minds to get back in the fire with you, to get back in fellowship with you, Lord. Lord, help us to be able to taste and see that you are good. Lord, I pray that we would be consistent in fellowship with you at church, in our personal private time with other believers, Lord. We would surround ourselves with people who are also chasing after you. And God, for those who feel like they don't have any fire at all, they don't have any passion, any zeal, any fervor for you. Lord, we know the answer to that is to have Jesus Christ in our lives. Lord, if they want it, if they want a relationship with you, they want you, Lord God, I pray they would call upon you to save them. Lord, to, to cleanse them from all their sins and be set on fire for you for a hunger and a heart to serve you, to live for you. And God, there, there's people in this room right now who think they can't. They can't have a heart for you. They can't live for you. Well, Lord, I pray you would change their thinking their mind because it's you in us that creates and stirs a hunger for you. Lord, I pray that we would be in that place where if we feel nothing, that we would call on you, that we'd be humble and admit that we need you. God, draw the men and women in here today who are even struggling to believe this is even real. You know who they are, God. Get their attention right now. Lord, may they feel your spirit burning inside them. May they feel the conviction, Lord, to, to call upon you as our Lord and Savior. Lord, I pray that you would convict us 
of our need for you, as your scripture says, that your Holy Spirit would convict us for our need, that a heart that knows that we need you. God, do that in our hearts. God, if we haven't felt a burden for you, God, I pray you reignite that in this place and those who are watching online. Thank you, God, that you will show up. Your word says, seek me with all your heart and you will find me if we seek you, Lord. So, Lord, I pray that we would do that today. And, God, may our fire for you, our zeal, our passion for you and your work be a wildfire that spreads in this community. Change lives all around us. As we are lit up for you, God, may it draw people to you. When they see that we're on fire and we're different, there's just something different about us and our countenance and the way we behave, that they'll be drawn to the fire, to the light, and want to see what's going on. Thank you, Lord, for doing that. We love you, God. We praise you. We give you all the glory and praise for what you're doing in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.